Now, last weekend, if you were here, you might remember that we started off talking about college football. Today, we're going to talk about pro football. This is the first weekend of the year that has a full slate of games. The games already began on Thursday night. Sunday, it's funny, when, when NFL season starts, our 915 crowd grows a little bit. People <laughs> like to get up a little bit earlier once football. It's an interesting little dynamic that I've noticed. But I have to tell you something at the beginning of the NFL season. This is an admission that may come as a surprise, maybe even a shock to some of you to hear a pastor say this. But I am an NFL agnostic. I'm an NFL agnostic. Now, for the vast majority of my life, I was a passionate Dallas Cowboys fan. I, I mean, listen, I lived and died with the Cowboys from the time I was a small boy till the time that I was a middle-aged person. I just, I mean, I bled and died with the Cowboys. But something happened sometime in the last few years where I just decided, you know what? Cowboy's gonna cowboy. And I'm done. Do you, do you understand? It's been 28 years. Say 28. Longer than most of you have been alive or married. 28 years since the Cowboys went to, an, to a conference title game. And every year I thought, man, you know what? We were this close. We were this close last year. This year. And I, I would get all invested. I would put all of my passion, all of my energy, all of my emotions into it. And then just a few years ago I went, you know what? I, 25, 26 years in on this run, I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. And I, I watch football. I love the game. I think it's a fascinating sport. And I'll, I'll pay attention and see if the Cowboys win or lose. But I don't care. My life is so much richer and fuller <laughs> since I reached NFL agnosticism. But you know, my misplaced way back in the past, passion for the Dallas Cowboys reveals a massive potential weakness in the human condition for all of us, not football fans, I don't care who you are. You see, the, the ability to feel, the capacity that we have for emotion is a strength that God has given to us. It, it's, a, it's unique to the human condition, but it's also true that our emotions our feelings are not always rooted in reality. They're not always rooted in reality. Take my passion for the Cowboys. I mean, I was, I was a fan. What is fan short for? Fanatic. I was fanatical. I was fervent. I was fixated on my feelings for the Cowboys. But eventually, I had to face the facts. And the facts are... Cowboy's going to cowboy. That that's just is what it is. Now, you may not even care about football. You may be wondering, why did this guy just spend two and a half minutes of a sermon on a Sunday morning talking about football? That is so shallow. And it would be if it weren't for this fact. Spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity emotional resilience, mental health, and intellectual integrity demand one thing. All four of those things, I'm gonna say them again because it's so important. It's so important. Spiritual maturity, emotional resilience, the, the number one predictor of success in life, statistically speaking. Mental health, I think the importance of that kind of speaks to itself, speaks for itself. And intellectual integrity all require the same thing. They require the ability, the capacity to recognize and respond to reality. You have to be able to recognize reality. You have to be able to respond to reality with reality if 
you're going to experience spiritual maturity, emotional resilience, mental health, and intellectual integrity. Now, some people might say, well, that, that's, that's fine. I understand it's a, it's a sermon, so you kind of need to you know, beef it up a little bit. But when it's all said and done, isn't it true that it doesn't really matter what you believe or what you think is real or true as long as you're a good person? And, that, and I've heard that a lot, and I understand where it's coming from, but I think that begs then a follow-up question. Okay, let's say that that is true. Then how do you determine what is good? How do you decide what is good or, on the flip side of that same coin, what is not good? I mean, are there objective, demonstrable actions and behaviors, realities that we could say are actually good, constructive, and helpful? And again, are there actual, demonstrable behaviors and activities that are not good, that are destructive, that are harmful? You see, this is right where we pick up the conversation that we started last week. Last week, we established the fact that when two worlds collide, something's got to give. And throughout this series, we're using the biblical record of the life of Daniel, the life of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as a lens through which to hopefully and prayerfully and biblically make sense of a messy, messy world. And when two worlds collide, something's got to give. We, we saw this last week when Daniel's faith in God, Daniel's faith as a Jew said, there is one true God, the God of Israel, and that belief came into a head-on collision with the Babylonian belief in multiple myriad gods who capriciously share their powers from time to time with certain people. And it, it happened over a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. Now, you have to understand, remember, during this time period, about 600 years before Christ, Babylon was the epicenter of military intellectual power on the planet. This was the center of the universe. And Nebuchadnezzar was the king. He would have functioned as a semi-God man in that belief system. And he had a very disturbing dream. And so he called together all of his advisors, his wise men and magi, the sorcerers, the astrologers. And he asked them to not only interpret the dream, but he said, I want you to tell me what the dream was because you're supposed to be so good at this. And, and long story short, we, we dove into this last week, Daniel, of all of Nebuchadnezzar's advisors, Daniel, after prayer, Daniel was the only one who could tell the king what the dream was and interpret it. But it was in that interpretation, it was in the telling of the dream that you see these two worlds collide. Just by way of review, let's look back at what Daniel said. Daniel chapter 2, verses 27 through 28. Daniel replied, now there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. Now, that's, that's a bold move right there. Daniel was very respectful right up until the point that Nebuchadnezzar's authority collided with God's authority over reality. And, and Daniel pointed this out, again, respectfully. He wasn't rude about it. He wasn't obnoxious. He wasn't a jerk. But he did say, King, let, let's be honest. Nobody on your team could pull this off, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. There is a God in heaven. This is the foundational, relentless reality of Scripture. There is a God in heaven. This is where it begins, that, that God started everything. And because he's God, because he created everything, he is the decider. He is the arbiter of truth and reality. So God set everything up. So what that means is all reality radiates out from God. God is the essence. He is the 
decision maker when it comes to what is real and what is true. Now, we, we established last week that, you know, this is not necessarily a bad thing when two worlds collide, but it is true that it's inevitable. Everybody has a belief system. You have a belief system. I have a belief system. Even people who don't really think about it, they operate as though they do. So whether your belief system is by default or by design, you got one. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you got one. And every belief system, to the degree that is different from another belief system, collides. And when those two worlds collide, something's got to give. It, it cannot be that two plus two equals four and five. Unless you're in a philosophy class at UT, smoking cloves in a black turtleneck, then you can pull it off. But in the real world, in the real world, it don't work. Daniel's belief system and Nebuchadnezzar's could not be equally valid. Something's got to give. That's what Daniel was saying here. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension, every pretender that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take every thought captive to Christ. We take every belief, every philosophy, every cultural wind that blows and read it through the grid of Christ. We read it through the grid of God's word. C.S. Lewis is one of the brightest minds of the 20th century. He was a scholar who spent most of his adult life as an atheist. He became an atheist at the age of 15 and, and was pretty firm and fervent in his atheism. But later in life, he came to faith in Christ and he spent the rest of his life pushing back against the academic tides that he had been steeped in at Oxford University in England. He had come out of the tradition of the, the liberal critical theory of the 19th century and the early 20th century, and he was pushing back against that relativistic, subjective truth world because of Christ. Always respectfully, always very, very intelligently, and Lewis wrote this, and this is a little bit of a long quote, but it's so important and it's so relevant for you and me. This is what C.S. Lewis wrote. He said, now, if all the world were Christian, it might not matter if all the world were uneducated. But as it is, a cultural life will exist outside the church, whether it exists inside or not. So Lewis is saying, there will be a belief system outside of the church, whether the church has one that is coherent and has intellectual integrity, the world will have one. So it, it matters what we believe and how we can articulate it. He goes on. To be ignorant and simple now, not to be able to meet the enemies on their own ground, intellectually, would be to throw down our weapons and to betray our uneducated brethren who have under God no defense but us, against the intellectual attacks of the heathen. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Lewis is saying, as a follower of Christ, not, not just as a pastor, not just as a scholar, but as a follower of Christ, we have to be able to articulate our faith. We've got to be able to stand up and say, this is what I believe and this is why I believe it. Second Peter says, always, say always. always, always be prepared in season and out to give a reason for the hope that you have and do this with gentleness and respect. That's what Lewis is saying here. Watch this. This is such a powerful, simple argument that he makes here. A man who has lived in many places is not likely to be deceived by the local errors of his native village. Isn't that true? If you travel, you, you gain a wider, broader perspective, and you learn how narrow some of your, you know, little village beliefs might be. The scholar has lived in many times and is therefore in some degree immune from the great cataract of nonsense 
that pours from the press and the microphone of his own age. Again, Lewis is saying here, I love that phrase, the great cataract of foolishness. What do cataracts do? Cataracts cloud your vision. Cataracts obscure what ought to be obvious and seen and real and true. Lewis is saying here, we don't have that luxury. We have got to be able to stand up and declare this is real. This is truth. In the book of Colossians, Paul says this, Jesus, he existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Jesus Christ was here before creation was here. He was the one who made it all. He created it. He will bring it to its historical conclusion. And in the meantime, he's the one who holds it all together. So truth, reality, a sound, coherent philosophy begins and ends and is held together in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on in the book of Colossians. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, you want wisdom, you want knowledge, you want Christ. The more you know Jesus Christ, the more you know and live the word of God, the more truth, the more reality, the more wisdom, the more knowledge you actually have. One of the things that we say about God, or three of the things really, we say that God is omnipresent. That means he is everywhere all at once. We say that God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. We say that he is omnipotent, all-powerful. But that word omniscience, omniscient, omnis omniscient. Omni is all, shunt is science. Knowledge, all-knowing is God. So, what you believe, what I believe about God, not what we feel, but what we know, determines the degree of wisdom and knowledge that we live with. It says here, in Christ is hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, in Christ. The book of Isaiah, chapter 55, says something so powerful and helpful. This is what it says. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah here, and he says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it will yield seal, yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Just so we're clear, where, we're, where we are right now at this moment, this is the tipping point of this whole series. This is... This is why we're doing this. The word of God is true. This is why it's so important that we teach this to our children, to our students, that this book, the Bible, is a gift from God. In his grace, in his wisdom, in his omniscience, all-knowingness, he has given us this book as a gift of love. Hey, we're giving y'all a t-shirt today. That's fine. God has given us his word. 
And the more we know this word, the more we live this word, the more we know, the more we love God. And the more we know and the more we love God, the better our lives work. If we could teach our children that this is the best picture of life, you want a life that is fun, you want a life of adventure, you want a life of resilience, you want a life of wisdom, start here. Start here, live here, finish here. Now, we worship God. We trust the word of God. So it's very important that we separate but stay, keep them connected. You see, the Christian faith requires a very real sense of humility. God says, as far as heaven is from earth, that's a pretty good distance. That's how far away our ways are from his ways. And so he says, I I've given you my word to help you bud and flourish. Like, like trees planted by streams of water. Man, right now in Austin, Texas, do we understand that, that little image? How many of you have a yard right now that's brown? Like I wake up every morning and I hear, I hear my lawn. Water. Sorry, not our day. The word of God waters our lives. It allows us to flourish and to bloom and to put down roots. This is why an investment in this book is so worth it. To, to, to be in a Bible study doesn't mean you're just a good person. It means that you are reading this book and allowing this book to read you. And when that happens, that's where the good stuff is. Now, I will tell you, there are some parts of this book that are really inconvenient. There are parts of that book that I have been looking for loopholes my whole life. But I will also tell you this, every single time that I've chosen to trust this book more than I trust me, my life has gone better. Everything gets better. Everything flourishes and blooms more. I, I can do an okay job for a while. God does a perfect job eternally. And so the investment in the word of God is worth it. And, and I wanna give you just very quickly, but very, very seriously, five ROI, returns on investment. When you invest in scripture, when I invest in knowing the word of God, this is, this is what comes back to us. When you invest in truth, when you do the work to know truth, to trust truth, and to live truth. Number one ROI is you root your life in reality. Root your life in reality. When you trust scripture more than you trust yourself, you are rooting your life in what is real, in what is true, as opposed to deception. Everything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God is a deception. Our enemy, Satan, is a deceiver. The first thing he did with Adam and Eve when he, uh, he, did, he, he tempted Eve because Adam was hiding somewhere. That's a whole other sermon series. But when he tempted Eve, what did he say? Did God really say don't eat from the tree of the knowledge? Of, I mean, did God really say that? And so he got her questioning and doubting the word of God. And then he got her to believe that God was holding out. He said, no, 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 no. You know why God told you that? Because he's holding out on you. He knows as soon as you do this, you're going to be like him. Ooh, that's a temptation I understand. You tell me I can be God, little g, God of my own life? I'm in. I love that action. I like to be in charge. Anybody else like to be in charge? That's a deception. I think this really helps us keep from getting judgmental. When we see ourselves, sometimes we can be judgmental on ourselves, can't we? When we see other people who have given in to temptation of any kind, 
We don't say, oh, I'm a bad person or they're a bad person. We say, they're being deceived. They have been deceived. Jesus drew a really bright line underneath this in John chapter 8. Look at what he says. He says, you are the children of your father, the devil. Yikes. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Any questions? When you root your life in the reality of Scripture, you leave that deception behind. Number two, return on investment in truth. Develop discernment. Truth allows us to develop the skill of discernment. Here's just a working definition of discernment, okay? Discernment is the skill to separate fact from fiction, reality from fantasy. That's discernment. If a person is experiencing a psychotic break, they can't do that. They can't separate fact and fiction. They, they live in, in an unreal world. Truth allows us to develop discernment as opposed to foolishness. Foolishness. That's what C.S. Lewis was talking about. The great cataract of nonsense that pours from the microphone of this age. Truth allows us to develop discernment. Number three, when you invest in truth, the return is that you grow through perseverance. Truth allows us to persevere when we choose to keep going, when we choose to stay at it. It's because we hold the truth of our hope. When I understand that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, fact, that helps me to kind of go, okay, that power raised him from the dead. That's going to pretty much cover whatever I've got going on. So I've got hope. And as long as I've got hope, I persevere. As opposed to fragility. It is so tragic how fragile our world is. But it is because we are getting further and further away from truth. And reality, don't, don't, don't offend anybody. We don't try to offend anybody. We give reason for the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. But we give it. I'm not going to be fragile. Walk around on eggshells. So, sometimes you know what that's like with people in your family, right? It's exhausting. Where's me slap out? Fortunately, I don't live with anybody like that. But I'm just saying, I want you to know it's not Julie or, or any of our kids. I don't mean that. But perseverance is the antidote to fragility and being fragile because of hope. Number four, return on investment in truth gives us the ability to love God in obedience. Obedience. And I know as soon as I say the word obedience, they, whoa, 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 hey, 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 hey. I'm not some dog to be trained with treats, okay? And you're not. But obedience in the Christian context is God's love language. Obedience, when I choose to obey the word of God, to do what it says to do, to not do what it, doesn't, what it says not to do, what I'm saying in essence is, God, I trust you more than I trust myself. And so I will love you in obedience as opposed to sin and brokenness. And then number five, an investment in truth gives us a return, the ability to choose peace, to choose peace, as opposed to anxiety and fear. I had a weird dream this week. Don't worry, it's not too weird, I'm going to tell you. In my dream. I was driving. This happened right before I woke up. I was driving my truck, and I, I came over the hill of a highway and had one of those massive hill country Texas panoramic views. You know what happens every now and then? And as I came over the hill, I was smiling. I was like, wow, that's awesome. I remember this vividly. 
But then all of a sudden in my dream, I kept going and my truck was flying over the hill. And it wasn't like a, a fun flying. Like it was Bo and Luke Duke flying over this hill. And all of a sudden I'm heading down and, and I don't remember saying anything, you know, unchristian in my dream. I just remember thinking, I'm gonna die. And when my truck hit the ground, I woke up. I kind of jerked awake and I was like, oh, I don't wanna wake up Julie. I was like, oh, <sighs> okay. That was a dream. I'm, I'm, I, that wasn't real. I'm okay. And I immediately remembered one night when Emily, our daughter, was five years old. She had a dream in the middle of the night. Woke up a blood-curdling scream. Julie and I, our bedroom was upstairs. Their bedrooms were downstairs. Woke us up. And when, for those of you who don't know, our daughter Emily has some pipes and so she was screaming. I would woke up out of a dead sleep. I was downstairs in four steps. I run into her bedroom. I grab her. I go, Emily, Emily, Emily. She's still asleep. She's still screaming. I climb in bed with her. I go, Emily, Emily, it's okay. Emily, you need to wake up. Emily, it's a dream. She kind of wakes up, startles a little bit, looks at me. I go, it's, it's okay. It's daddy. I got you. It's okay. She realizes that it was a nightmare, a dream. And she realizes she's safe. And then I'm sitting there, I'm I go, baby, you're safe. No, nobody's here. It's just mom and me. We got you. You're fine. Don't worry about it. And she just starts sobbing, just crying, just broken down from the fear. Now, I will tell you, as a dad, our kids got hurt. We went to the emergency room on a fairly regular basis. That didn't really phase me. It's like, if, if you're not getting hurt, you're not kidding hard enough. <clears throat> I, I really believe that. But when my kids were scared, it went all through me. I mean, I, oh, to see my child afraid broke my heart. But I'll tell you something else that went all through me to be able to be the one to comfort them, to bring them back to reality and let them know, not just tell them, but let them know they were okay. Julie had already drifted all back to sleep. I'm down there holding Emily. She's sobbing, crying, kind of trying to get it together. <laughs> Snot running down my arms. From her, not from me. And I just got to tell, I go, Emily, I got you. It's okay. It's okay. You're going to be okay. Not because I had her, but because her heavenly father has her. Because as long as she trusts in him, as long as Joe trusts in him, they're going to be fine. That was, that was the main thing we wanted them to leave the house with. The second thing was we wanted them to leave the house. But the main thing was we wanted them to leave the house with the reality that as long as they follow God, he's got them. And they don't have anything to fear. I cannot overstate how important truth is that you think about, that we think about what we think about. And when it's all said and done, we come back to true north. We fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. He created everything. He will conclude everything. But in the meantime, he holds it all together. This is the only reality that makes sense. It's the only truth that holds no matter what. And it's available for you to live in. It's available for us to walk around and live in that truth and to live it out. To share with our uneducated brethren, the folks who just don't know yet, the folks we know who don't yet know, and they're still looking through cataracts of nonsense. 
Jesus clears away all of the clutter, all of the cloud. He says, fix your eyes on me and follow me. I want to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. If you're here today and you have never chosen to follow Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, then we want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Just to pray right where you're sitting, just say, silently talk to him and say, Jesus, I need you. I will follow you from this moment forward. I confess my sin to you in order to claim and receive your grace and your forgiveness. And I pray this prayer in your name. I wanna ask you just to remain with your heads bowed for a moment. And in this moment, if that was your prayer, then as a church, we want to help with the moments that follow. We have a, a gift for you that's just a, a, a new believers, a new Christ followers packet. You can claim it out in the lobby at the area called the hub out there. If you're online, let your service host know and we can make sure that we get one of those to you. But as our heads are bowed for just another moment, if that was your prayer, would you raise your hand? Just raise your hand and hold it up high over your head for just a moment as a statement of that commitment that you just made. And know that as a family of faith, we celebrate that with you. And as you put your hands down, we're gonna put our hands together and tell you welcome home. Welcome home.